speaker this morning is Eric Paluca. Eric is a native Texan. He was born in Corpus Christi, graduated high school in Cameron, Texas. He also graduated Sam Houston State in 2011 with a bachelor's in agricultural engineering and a minor in chemistry. He's married to the former Lauren West, and they have two children, Seth and Naomi. And we're proud of them, well, all of them, especially the grandchildren. Lauren and Eric are members of the Spring Church of Christ, where Eric serves as one of the elders. And we're also proud of Eric and the good job that he's doing and has been doing. And we appreciate all his work here at the congregation. Everybody's laughing, so what did I say? Oh, one of the deacons. Serves one of the deacons. Maybe one of these days. I know. One of these days, maybe. Serves as one of our deacons. Mine's one track, I guess, this morning. But we are thankful for Eric and all he does do and the work he's committed himself to here at the church and for his ability to speak. We look forward to hearing him. Come speak to us, Eric. I'm certainly thankful to be given this opportunity to speak to you. Appreciate also especially being considered part of this lectureship. I'm also thankful for my recent promotion. <laughs> well, Brother Danny, I have two cough drops. Well, this morning we'll be discussing the worship of the church, the worship of the church as we continue our theme. Now, notice before we really begin whose church we're talking about. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's the Lord's church. And because of this, it is not unreasonable for the Lord then to have certain requirements for that church. One of, su one of such of these requirements would include worship. Now, worship is an action that is motivated from the heart of reverence for the divine with the knowledge of who he is and what he has done for us. The ISBE has this to say about worship. It is honor, reverence, homage in thought, feeling, or act paid to men, angels, or other spiritual beings, figuratively and other entities, ideas, powers, or qualities, but specifically and supremely to deity. The New Testament idea of worship is a combination of the reverential attitude of mind and body, the general ceremonial and religious service to God, the feeling of awe, veneration, adoration, with the outward and ceremonial aspects approaching, but not reaching the vanishing point. The total idea of worship, however, both in the Old and New Testaments, must be built up, not from the words specifically so translated, but also and chiefly from the whole body of description of worshipful feeling and action, whether of individuals singly and privately or of larger bodies <clears throat> engaged in the public services of sanctuary, tabernacle, temple, or synagogue, upper room, or meeting place. Thus, worship is a very special occasion. And as worshiping in the church, it must be considered special. It must be performed correctly. Now, when you consider the New Testament, there are four types of worship that are outlined, mentioned. First is vain worship. This is empty, worthless, man-made. It's after man-made traditions, Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. Then we have ignorant worship. This is pictured in Acts chapter 17, verses 23 through 31. Specifically, those worshiping there had an altar to the unknown God. Then there is will worship, and that is worship that is made to please oneself. 
Colossians chapter 2, verse 23, and Titus chapter 1, verse 14. And fourth, there is true worship, and that is done in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. Now, within this true worship, there must exist three elements in order to make that worship acceptable to God. First, we must have the right object, that is God, the creator of all things. This is the, the object towards the action of worship is directed to. Secondly, the right attitude in spirit. This involves sincerity, respect and awe for the Creator and our fellowship with Him. This is by which one endeavors to become more like the object of the worship, that is God. And third, the right way. This is in truth, by the instruction of deity, that is the truth, the word, and we must follow only what has been authorized. Thus, it is not reliant on the commands or whims of man. Now, these three elements taken together will provide a test for each individual act of worship performed by the individual and collectively the church. Acceptable worship to God by man must be performed by, with knowledge of God and his will for man in spirit and in truth and with the same attitude of Christ. John chapter 6, verse 38. We note in Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, that Ezra had to prepare his heart to seek the Lord. We too must prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. So are we mentally engaged? Are we emotionally engaged throughout the period of worship? Are we in the appropriate attire for this event? Worship is a formal event. Now granted, not everyone has been blessed to the same extent, but we should offer our the best attire that we have. After all, we are worshiping our Creator who has given us all these blessings. I think it's interesting that whenever we have a formal banquet, we find a way to get either a new tuxedo or our suits neatly pressed. As clean as ache we can get them. We shine our shoes, might even brush our teeth. But whenever it comes to worship, we come in with slacks, maybe blue jeans, some of which look like blue jeans I had when I was on the ranch. They've got holes in them. Is this the type of attire we should have as we gather before our Creator? Keep in mind that the proper clothing often affects and often does affect our mentality towards the acts that we're about to engage in. It helps put us or give us the proper attitude to perform whatever it is we're attempting to perform. Thus, the neater and nicer that we dress, the proper attitude follows along with it. Now, with these different things in mind, I want us to consider the worship of the church as it is authorized by the Bible. Now, before we begin with the worship, I would like to lay some groundwork regarding Bible authority. Thus, we have this nice little PowerPoint. Don't laugh too much. How are we to know what exactly authority is? What is authorized? Well, first off, what is authority? Authority is the right to make laws and then expect results, to, to expect obedience. Law is our rules and regulations. It is a rule of action. God has given man rules of action. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Now, how are these rules of actions communicated to man? Well, we see in Romans chapter 5, verse 21, that grace reigns through righteousness. From Psalm 119, verse 117, we see that righteousness are the commands of the Lord, the commands of God. Specifically for us today, this is bound in the law of Christ, that is the New Testament. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and again Romans chapter 5 verse 21. Christ has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Not just some, but all authority 
Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Thus, if we are to act, we must have his authority as the lawgiver. Colossians 3, 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Jesus gave his law via words, language. Language, and therefore the Bible, authorizes in three ways. Direct statements, implication, and accounts of action or examples. A direct statement, you're told exactly what to do. It's pretty self-explanatory. An implication are the results or the actions that one must follow. If told to meet, this implies there's somewhere for us to meet and there is a some time for us to meet. Accounts of action. These are different examples that we can read about in the scriptures. But how are we bound by these examples? Well, first, one must gather all the material that is listed regarding a particular subject. And depending on the evidence for that subject, we are able to find what indeed is binding on us today. Some accounts are situational and they're meant to accommodate, while many show a pattern for the church to follow. There are two kinds of account of action. There are those that may be followed, and then there are those that must be followed. And if one does not, they sin by not following that example. Well, this brings us to our PowerPoint. I'm going to use the plan of salvation because it's something that we're all familiar with. I have here a list of nine different things that I would consider possible for the plan of salvation. Now, taking a look at Scripture, we find that Romans 10, 17 says that one is supposed to hear the Word of God. And then gaining that faith, Romans chapter 10, verse 11, coupled with John 8, 24, tells us that we are to believe in the deity of Christ. Next, we're supposed to repent, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. And then confess Christ publicly, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And then finally, one must be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of sins, Romans chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, as well as Acts chapter 22, verse 16. What about the other four? Well, they're not authorized. When you take these five steps and you compile them, when one has complied with each authorized act and finally being baptized, since you've completed those acts, you are now authorized to become a Christian. Taking any of those other four steps, one, are not authorized, and they will not make you a Christian. And it could be any other step if you want to do something else besides count beans. Now, we must point out that whenever you consider authority, authority does not exclude. And I think this is something, I, well, I know this is something I've struggled with until being taught better, that authority includes. You see, you consider that list that we had, those nine items. God authorized how one is to become a Christian. He didn't, by saying we need to hear, he didn't say you, well, you don't need to count beans. That's lunacy. Whenever you go to Chick-fil-A or pick another spot, when you ask for a number one with Kobe Jack cheese, maybe some bacon, you don't have to say, well, I don't want a number two, I don't want a number three, I don't want a number four. You have authorized them to make a number one for you, and you've even given some extra requirements. Authority includes. Now, you note each of those five steps did not exclude the other. See, if authority excludes, if you hear, that excludes believing. 
Well, that doesn't make sense either. But you see, authority adds. God specified, he authorized hearing. Then he added to that belief. Then he added to that repentance. And he added to that confession. And he added to that baptism. He even specified the type of baptism. And that is a barrel in water. Now as we now consider our options for worship, I have another list for us to consider as we go through scripture. First, I would like for us to consider the contribution as worship. That is the collection of money, the giving. Passages regarding this concept, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Another passage to consider is Romans chapter 12, verse 8, which there says, He that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. The American Standard Version there has liberality. As we're always trying to stay away from liberalism, here's one point where the Christian must be liberal, and that is in their giving. Another passage to consider would be 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Also Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. Chapter 22, verse 21. Mark chapter 12, verses 29 and 30. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, as well as chapter 10, verse 26. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 through 11. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. What exactly can we learn from each of these passages? Well, regarding the passage that we read in 1 Corinthians, we note that Paul gave order to four churches, to at least four churches. That is Galatia, Macedonia, Achaia, and obviously Corinth. Who is this order given to to contribute, to take up this collection with? Well, that would be the saints. Christians were to participate in this collection. This means that all Christians with income must participate. Rich or poor, young or old, male or female. And I would like to add here, on a lunch break at work the other day, I had a discussion with a couple co-workers. And one of them had reasoned that I just don't like going, he was, he's got a very Catholic background. I just don't like being in their assembly because they're always asking for money. And then you turn around and you have folks like Joel Osteen and all these other folks that they're always asking for money. And then you turn around, they're flying off in their private jets or their helicopters. And I said, well, co-worker, we're expected to give on the first day of the week. You don't have a problem with the giving of money. You have a problem with the abuses thereof. He said, well, why do I need to give my money? Well, we're going to get to that in a little bit. But we would like to note when we are to take up this collection. It's spelled out for us. There on the first day of the week. How should the Christian give? 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 6 through 7 says we ought to give cheerfully. Verse 7 there says we should give with purpose. Now this purposing must occur before the assembly ever begins, before we even assemble here in this building or out under the shade tree. This involves proper planning. You see, a last-minute reach for the wallet or the purse is not purposing. At that point, it's really too late. Now, we're not saying that if you forget, although you can't forget the day before, but we're all human. We do make mistakes. We might forget to cut the check. We might forget to bring out the money. We're talking about 
the, the rule of operation, the generality here. If you're waiting to the last minute to give, you have not purposed properly to God. We are to give as one prospers. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. God allows each and every one of us to prosper in some way, to some extent or another. We might not prosper on the same level as our brethren, but I can guarantee you that we all prosper. Surely we can budget to give at least once a month, maybe even every week. We must give with respect to balance. We must recognize that we do all have responsibilities in this world. We all run a business. Running a home is a business. We have expenses. We have income. Just as gears move in sync, our giving must be in sync with all these other responsibilities. Romans chapter 12, verse 8, and 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. <clears throat> This deals with the liberality of our giving. 2 Corinthians 8, 5 says, And, and they, this they did, not as we hoped, but gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. See, when you give yourself to the Lord, everything else falls into place, even our giving. Now, what purpose does the money serve that is collected? And this refers to the answer I gave my coworker. You see, the church operates in the world. There are bills to pay. Right now, we're benefiting from air conditioning. We don't have somebody in the back over a block of ice fanning right now. There are laws against that. But there are utilities to pay. There's phone bills. There's water. There's electri electricity. There's trash. Each of these are services that are offered. There's loans to pay back, property taxes. We might have to repay the loan for the building itself or even the grounds. Think of all the different toiletry items that we have, the paper goods, the soap. All these different things don't just randomly appear in our facilities. Someone has to purchase them. Someone has to have the means of purchasing them. Supplies for worship. Consider the trays laid out here on the Lord's Supper table. Somebody has to purchase those supplies. You think of the songbooks we've been using, all the different materials for teaching. They don't just magically appear. Also, the salary for a located preacher. Consider any kind of missionary work. None of these items are free. Thus, the church needs funds now consider Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 through 12 will a man rob God yet ye have robbed me but ye say wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings ye are cursed with a curse for ye have robbed me even this whole nation bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there, be, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven <clears throat> and pour you out a blessing, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be delightsome, or a delightsome land with, or saith the Lord of hosts. Now granted, we don't tithe today, but the principle is still there. Do we rob God in our giving? What type of attitude do we present when we do give? What kind of givers are we in worship? Thus we see that God has authorized giving as a part of our worship. Next, I would like for us to consider partaking of the Lord's Supper. Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29, which reads, 
As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Also consider 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 26. Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 23. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 through 17. Again, what can we learn from these passages? Well, the Lord's Supper, we'd like to consider what it is. It's considered the Lord's table. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21. This is a memorial that shows His death, the Lord's death, not His resurrection. It is referred to as, quote, breaking bread in different contexts. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Who, then, is to partake of this Lord's table? We see in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, that it is the Christians, the disciples of Christ, members of the church, Acts chapter 2, verses 41, through, uh, or and verse 47. Thus, Christians are the only ones authorized to partake of this supper. What is the purpose? This supper, the time that we spend on taking this supper, should call to mind the sufferings of our Savior during His crucifixion. It preaches Christ's death. It preaches the new, co the co the new covenant. It shows the worshiper's anticipation for His return. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16 and 17 show us that this is how the Christian communes with their Lord. And it is how the, the Christian communes with fellow Christians. When is this supper to be observed? Again, the first day of the week. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and Acts chapter 20, verse 7. In Acts chapter 20, we see in verse 16 that Paul was on a journey to Jerusalem. He wanted to get there by Pentecost to observe that feast. But we see that he arrives in Troas and that he delays his trip for seven days. It's kind of a strange thing to do when you're in a hurry to get somewhere. But he did it. What could be so important, especially keeping in mind the means of travel that he had at this time, what would be so important that he would delay his trip for seven days? Well, the answer is quite simple. Meeting with the brethren on the first day of the week to partake of this Lord's Supper, to contribute of his means, and as we'll show later, perform other acts of worship. Now, couple this with 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, and we see that this is to, to be performed every first day of the week. That is the phrase, until he comes. We don't just partake partake of it one Sunday okay we're done we don't know when the Lord's coming back thus every first day of the week has been authorized has been prescribed for the partaking of this Lord's Supper now how should we partake well it says we should partake in a worthy manner 1 Corinthians 11 chapter 27 through verse 29 it says wherefore Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now this phrase, or the word unworthily, doesn't mean the worshiper itself. It's a verb. It's how we partake of this supper, 
calling to mind the crucifixion, the death, the suffering of our Lord, we need to partake of these emblems themselves in the proper manner, proper respect. Now, what are the elements of this Lord's Supper? Well, the first element is unleavened or unfermented bread. When we read a moment ago in Matthew 26, the meal that they had been partaking of was the Passover feast. Well, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper out of this feast. Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 20. Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 17. And Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 14. We see that this feast originally was enacted for the Jews in Exodus chapter 12, verses 14 through 20. In Exodus chapter 13, verses 3 through 10. Faithful Jews were quite careful in observing this Passover meal. Luke 22, verse 1. Acts chapter 12, verse 3 and 20, verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. So much so that according to manners and customs of the Bible times, speaking within the homes... All cooking utensils had to be thoroughly cleansed or new ones were purchased. On the 13th day of Nisan, the house was to be searched by the father of the household to ensure that there was no leavened bread in it. This is the care they took on the day before they would search the house and verify that there was no leavening in that house, no leavened bread. Thus, in preparation for this great feast of unleavened bread, all leavening agents were removed from the house. They were not permitted back inside the house until after the feast had concluded. Then we think about the second element, and that is the fruit of the vine. This element also used in context of the Passover meal. Again, no fermenting agent was to be allowed within their houses. Thus, just as with the bread, the fruit of the vine must be unfermented. Thus, this grape juice is just that. It's no wine as we refer to it nowadays. It's not alcoholic. It's simply grape juice. How is the Lord's Supper to be administered? Well, in accordance with the accounts of action, Jesus gave thanks for the bread. He distributed it to the saints, and they partook. Then he gave thanks for the fruit of the vine, distributed it to the saints, and they partook. Now the prayers offered for these emblems should really be limited to the subject at hand. While we should be a grateful people, we shouldn't be thanking God for the great weather or any other things that we might be benefiting from. We are partaking of the Lord's Supper. We are to be thankful for each emblem, thankful for the death of our Savior, and then we partake. Adding to our list, authorized acts of worship, the Lord's Supper. Now, I think my cough drops have run out, but I still have material. So we'll try to move a little hastier. We now consider prayer as an act of worship. I'd like to reference 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. Pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says they had steadfastly continued in prayer. Acts chapter 12, verse 5, it says the church was praying for Peter while he was in prison. The church was praying without ceasing. Other passages to consider, Romans 12, verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, and there's a whole host of others. But we see that Jesus gave the disciples for a, a model prayer in which to follow. They requested, Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, teach us to pray. We also see this model in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Thus we see a simple pattern for prayer. 
Prayers are to be addressed to God the Father. We are to speak what is on our mind. And the prayers to be offered by the authority of Christ or in His name. John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Chapter 6, or chapter 16, verses 23 through 26. Colossians 3, 17. Ending with amen, or so be it. Now what and how should we pray publicly? What should we be praying for? Follow the pattern, which is just referenced. We should be a thankful people. Thus thanking God for the various things that he's given us is certainly on the table. Our gratitude, Matthew chapter 15, verse 36. Now we must keep in mind that these public prayers are a petition. They're a formal request made to God. James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Supplications. Pleading and intercession made for the brethren. We should be thankful for our daily needs. For God's people. We should pray for those who are sick. We could pray to resist temptation. For the forgiveness of sins. Pray for our enemies. For wisdom. For our leaders. I think as the days go on, our leaders need more of our prayers. And I don't say that in any kind of joking way. Pray that God's will be accomplished. Pray that we would be instruments in that will being accomplished. These prayers should be offered in faith, sincerity. They must be thoughtful. They must be fervent or genuine. And they're on behalf of everyone. While there is only one leader, whoever is leading that prayer speaks for everyone present. Now, individually, we should all be praying. And if it's the case that we're following after that leader's prayer, so be it. But when I lead a prayer publicly, I'm leading it for all of us. I am directing a portion of the worship. We pray. We pray to God. Just as in, spoiler alert, singing, we have one leader, but we all sing. Thus, prayer is an authorized act of worship. Which brings us to singing. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 says, Speaking to yourselves in hymns and, or psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Let the, Lord, the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Would we'll also reference Acts chapter 16, verse 25, Matthew 26, verse 30, Romans 15, verse 9, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, James chapter 5, verse 13. Now what can we learn from the two passages that we just read as well as taking all the New Testament says about singing? Specifically with Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16, these verses indicate a public assembly of Christians. Now in that assembly we are to make melody. That term comes from the Greek word solo which meant to pull or touch, to twang with reference to the bowstring or to touch the strings of the harp. According to Thayer's, in the New Testament, this term means to sing a hymn, to celebrate the praises of God in song in honor of God, such as in James chapter 5, verse 13. Thus, we pluck the strings of the heart as we sing. Now, in this assembly, Christians are to sing and thus use coherent words. Coherent words. Now, this is a little chart. Kinds of music, you have two kinds. That's vocal and non-vocal. Now, part of the non-vocal, you have non-mechanical and mechanical. The non-mechanical would... Con Consists of clapping hands, snapping fingers, stomping feet. 
This is not the place or time for those things. Those things are not authorized. With mechanical, here's a list of instruments, mechanical instruments that would be included in that category. But then you look at vocal. Vocal singing must communicate a message. Non-communicable. Well, that's humming. That's whistling. That's even simulating the use of mechanical instruments. There's a, a German rock band. I guess they're considered metal. They're an a cappella rock band. And they're so good that their voices can simulate a guitar. They have a drum set up in the back, but they're able to simulate mechanical instruments. While that is impressive, that does not communicate a message. Thus, vocal communica communicable is the only thing authorized. Now, this would include foreign tongue or native tongue. I barely speak the English language, but I'm using that to the best of my ability. Just as is when we're in the worship assembly, we should all be able to do the same thing. We're not singing when we babble, or when we babble while we sing, we're not authorized to do that. We're not worshiping God as He has commanded, as He has authorized. Now, each member sings to each other member. Thus, we convey a message to our, our members, to each other. And we do this at the same time. That's the purpose of singing. We communicate a message. Thus, we need to be mindful and careful of the different songs that we do sing. Because each of us are teaching one another. If we sing a song that is not scriptural, we're now guilty of teaching false doctrine. Thus, we need to be very careful in what we say specifically with the singing. In light of each of these things, choirs and choruses, choruses are not authorized because we're watching, well, some denominations have this chorus, this choir, and they're sitting up in front of everybody and they're singing. Well, I'm not able to teach them. They're talking at me. That's not what God has authorized. God has authorized singing by each individual Christian in the assembly. Now, Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, God points out that he gave man a voice. And as such, we should be able to use that voice for him. Now, I admit that I am not the greatest singer. I probably couldn't even carry a tune in a bucket. I know I can't sing very well even in the shower. But there's one clear solution to that. If you don't like the way I sing, the how I, how I sing, that is, sing louder than me. Drown out my voice. I won't be offended because I guarantee you I'm going to try to sing louder than those around me because we're not singing for the benefit of people here necessarily. While we are teaching, we're singing to God. That's our audience. God is our audience. Now, the part of this singing is we pick up the book, we read, we read the words, we follow along, we sing. We don't stare at the book. We don't just sit there and kind of slouch and look ahead. You're not participating in the worship when you do that. Thus, you're sinning by not worshiping God. That worship is offensive to God. And adding any of these non-vocal, take your pick, Adding any of those unauthorized acts to the singing or any other portion of worship is offensive to God. He's given us all good thing or good things, that is 2 Timothy chapter 3, 17, all things that point to good works. If it's not authorized, it's not a good work. Thus it's offensive to God. It's not a component of godliness. Thus singing is an authorized act of worship. Which brings us to our fifth and final act of worship, that is preaching and teaching. Acts 2.42, they're found steadfastly keeping with the apostles' doctrine. Acts 20 and 7, or chapter 20, verse 7, the apostle Paul continued his speech till midnight. It might look like that's what I'm trying to do, but I'm 
I'm not, I promise. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. We know from these different passages that the first century church continued in the apostles' doctrine. That doctrine is conferred through teaching. Part of that doctrine was to preach and teach on the first day of the week. Now this teaching was intended to help each and every member to grow so that all can benefit. Now 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 15 through 16 points out that when a preacher grows, those he preaches to also grow. Now in order for this to occur, certain elements must be present. We find them in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5. Now, many have often referred to preaching like this as very negative. And I would say that it's two-thirds negative. But that's what God expects. We are to reprove, expose, or bring to light, convict, and correct. We're expected to rebuke, that is, to charge against or admonish sharply. We see Jesus rebuking evil spirits, the winds, even his own disciples. We are to exhort, that is, to give comfort, to encourage, strengthen, and admonish. Sound preaching will contain at least one of these aspects. Now, preaching is not, nor should it ever replace, personal study. It should be, however, a supplement. In so doing, it shows the truth of God's word, John 17, verse 17. Sound preaching will show a pure gospel. The pure gospel, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. It will point to the fact that God's word has a freeing ability to be able to make those disciples of Christ, John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. And sound preaching will be able to warn others against false teachers, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. He even names many people in the New Testament. We won't be able to discuss them too much, but Hymenaeus and Philetus, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. And there's several others. He named them. By exposing false teachers, we name names. We must do this. We name the doctrine. We name the error. We name names. Ultimately, the results of good, sound preaching will lead others to heaven. It will help others, the Christians, to grow in their maturity. Thus, preaching is the fifth and final authorized act of worship. When you take all five of these acts, you have authorized first day of the week worship. Now, I would point out that some believe that Wednesday night services are not worship. We've studied this morning that each of these five individual acts are worship. Now, taking of the Lord's Supper has only been observed in Scripture on the first day of the week. But if we sing, pray, and preach on a Wednesday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, based on what Scripture says, we are still worshiping. Therefore, it is just as important to be present on that time because we're worshiping God in spirit and in truth. I have also been taught when I was younger that if you come to the morning worship dressed similarly how I am, this was back before I, I had a suit, and you come that night, you don't have to dress as nice because you did that morning. That doesn't make any sense. It's still first day of the week worship. We're coming before our Creator. Thus, we should be dressed appropriately, ready to worship in the acts prescribed, authorized by His Word. Thus, we have studied this morning the worship of the church, those acts that He has authorized the church to perform. As we noted, Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and earth. Roman, or Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 
And he commanded his apostles to remain and to teach others all those things he commanded them. Here we enter into the, implica the implication side of things. He told them to remain in what he taught them. But then he told them to teach what they had learned. Thus, we've now learned what Christ has for us. What he has authorized for us to do specifically in worship. We are beneficiaries of what they taught. I'd like to leave you with this note here. A quote from Robert S. Camp in Binding and Implication. The reason I am bound by God's word is not that I read it, but that he wrote it. The reason I am bound by those things implicit in his word is not that I inferred it, but that he implied it. May we never fall victim to the same snares of ideology as Nadab and Abihu by offering strange fire. Leviticus chapter 10 verse 1 and 2. Nor by believing strange doctrines. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 9. And with respect to the Creator, let us always be mindful of the words. We're not going to be able to read it. But Malachi chapter 1 verses 6 through 8. And only offering those things that God has authorized us to offer Him in worship. Now this morning we have studied those things that are necessary for one to become a Christian. We have outlined the plan of salvation, those things that God has authorized one to do to become a child of God. If you've not become one this day, why not? Take the steps to become a Christian. Now if you're already a child of God and yet you've allowed sin into your life, repentance and prayer, confess your faults and we'll pray with you, we'll pray for you. If either of these needs apply to you, make it known as together we stand and sing.